I'll go ahead and say it. When I grow up, I want to be like Dan Balser. If you're a consistent follower of Breaking and Entering, then chances are you have Dan's podcast, Don't Get Me Started, on your playlist. If you don't, do so. Dan is the coolest guy. He's been in the ad business since 1987 at agencies both big and small and has seen it all. Boom. Rhyme. From Bloomington, Indiana to New York City to Atlanta, Georgia, Dan is currently the program director of copywriting at the famous Creative Circus. We dive right into it this episode. It's awesome. In about 30 minutes, we talk about ad school, breaking into advertising, his favorite Super Bowl ads, and in the end, he lays out five main pieces of advice directly tailored for you. To connect and see his recommended resources, head to our Instagram, at EnteringAd. To find his podcast, Don't Get Me Started, it may help to search his name on the search bar, Dan Balser. Hey, this is a great episode, so lock in. This is the Breaking and Entering Advertising Podcast, and I am your accomplice, Gino Schellenberger. Kick it, Mike. <laughs> Correctly? No, it's Dan. Dan Balser, welcome to the Breaking and Entering Advertising Podcast. Thanks for coming on, man. Thanks awesome. for having me. I appreciate it. A huge fan. We were talking before. Um, you are the host of Don't Get Me Started uh, and also the copyright copywriter head at the Creative Circus. So super excited to have you. I've been listening to your stuff when I first started this podcast. You've been an influence for me and excited to just talk. You know, because you'll you're good at this stuff. Yeah, I've been doing. I've been having conversations with microphones for like fourteen years, so it's it's kind of a familiar familiar range. Although I think I've only been a guest on like maybe one other podcast ever. So this is this is a, a weird to be on the other side of the other side of the screen, I guess. No way. What was the other one? I don't remember. <laughs> guess, well, guess was it me. advertising related? Yeah, it's advertising related. I don't remember. I don't remember <clears throat> though. Something a long time ago. Yeah. So we can take this conversation so many different ways, right? So I think the big thing I want to go over for our guests, really, our guests are students or recent graduates in advertising that are looking to break in and they want advice. And with all the experience you have, you've probably got a lot of advice. Yeah. But I also want to just, I'm curious because I'm not on the creative track. Um, I just want to know what the creative life is like. What's it like going to portfolio school? Why the creative circus? So I'll let you choose where we want to start off because I'm interested in all these different angles. Yeah, I think, um, you know, advertising schools kind of sprang up from a need uh, 25, 30 years ago when agencies decided they didn't want to take in young people and train them. Uh, That undergrad degree, in other words, you had to show that you could do the job before you got the job. They wanted yeah. people that could do the job day one. So advertising school is kind of filled in where people, you know, you spend two years kind of learning the ropes in a very real world situation so that day one at the job, you can actually do the job. Plus you come out with a portfolio. I mean, you can, portfolio school, it's called that for a reason. It's because you have to show how you would think given sort of best case scenario so that you can be, ju- obviously, you know, how you can be judged, how you think. So, um, you know, it started that way as the way to get in the business and it's kind of been the model for a long time. I will say that it, I still think of ad schools, um, portfolio schools as the ultimate cheat code. I think it's like sort of the direct route to a job. Um, I think that, you know, the best agencies are still recruiting out of ad schools. I don't think uh, that it's the only way to get a job in advertising. I think that especially today, I think some people are resource, resourceful enough to kind of prove their own vision, their own creative sensibilities and put together either you know, 100,000, 500,000 followers on social media, or they've done yeah. something on their own where they, they kind of become a brand that an agency would want. So it's not the only way, but, you know, I sleep at night really well as the head of the copywriting program at the circus. Mm-hmm. I've been doing this role for, you know, a long, long time because our alumni get good jobs and they keep their jobs. And one yeah. of the things that I will often say is it's not my job at the ad, at portfolio school to get the student a job. It's my job to help them keep their job. So I really, I I really want to kind of train 
people how to be those roles, not just do that job, how you, how to be a creative, how to be an art director, how to be a copywriter. Um, and also we have graphic design and um, interactive development, content creation and photography. So our alumni are professionals the day they, the day they leave. Yeah. And it's in, uh, you're in Atlanta. Am I in, right on that? In Atlanta, 70 degrees in, in late February, that's, mid, that's uh, nice. early February. Yeah. That's nice. I, and I know another big one, and I don't know if you're, if I'm allowed to say it with you is Miami ad school, another a pretty well-known one. Those Definitely. are the two at the top of my, and VCU brand center, I think is another big one, but what makes you guys different? What, why, uh, what's so great about the circus? You know, and what do you, what do you guys offer that might be different? You know, I think that when people ask me this question, prospective students ask me this question, I, I tell them often that it's sort of a gut feeling. I think mm -hmm. if you have drive and talent, I think a lot of schools can get you where, where you want to go. Um, it's just a matter of where you think you can thrive and what, where the environment sort of fits your own sensibility. And the creative circus started off, you know, and we still kind of are scrappy. Um, I think of the school as a, as a workshop. Um, our space is kind of in a, you know, a transformed warehouse and it's not polished. It's just kind of roll up your sleeves and get it done sort of environment. And it looks amazing uh, online. Yeah, that's cool. And, yeah. um, and the ethos mm. of the founders is also, um, it's just a little philosophical, but the ethos of the founders, the reason why I gravitated towards, towards there when I got back to Atlanta after I lived, I, I lived and worked in New York for 10 years as a writer, ACD, CD. When I came back to Atlanta, I wanted to teach at the circus because there's a philosophy of the school where we're kind of very supportive and everyone's in it together. And there's a, it sounds kind of like a little kumbaya, a little new age to say that, but I really feel like we kind of hammer in that like we're, Helping your classmates helps you. Um, everyone gets better jobs. All boats, you know, rise in the, in, when the water rises, all boats rise. And we try not to make it a competitive environment. I mean, a blank page is enough of an enemy. You don't want your classmate to be an enemy. Uh, yeah. So uh, really, really, really try hard to make sure that this very collaborative and very supportive. Um, and, and, you know, I think that if, if I had a, a nephew or something that was looking to go to an ad sure. school, I'd say, go visit them, sit in a class, get a sense for the students and the teachers and make, make that decision um, on your own. Mm -hmm. No, that's good. Yeah. It's, it's gotta be about the feel. Cause if you're a creative and you don't, you don't vibe with it or whatever the, the term might be, you're probably not going to create the best work. So go check them out. Uh, I like that you said scrappy though. And I, it looks like that online. I like the setup. How are you guys doing virtually is my question. Is yeah. it, uh, has it been good? Yeah. I, I'll get to that in one second. I'm going to say one more plug for this. One more plug for this. School. I'm not going to name okay. any other schools in a negative way, but we have had quite a few students leave other programs to come to our program because they weren't getting what they needed. And one of the mm -hmm. things that we have is we have a full-time staff. I'm there full-time. Our program director for, for art directions there full time. We have two senior advisors, like basically available, unfortunately, 24 <laughs> seven. Um, and I think that, that, that gets kind of back to that family situation where we be, we're accessible. Um, and I think I take a lot of pride in that. Um, so the online thing, so let's, let's put it out there, man, this year has sucked. I mean, yeah. it's been really, it's been really hard. And, um, starting off last spring, it was really hard for us. And I know you were graduating from school at the time and we were trying to figure it out. And it was a tough adjustment for students who started off on the ground and they went online. Um, and it's starting to get to me too, man. Like I'm starting to like, I'm, I'm sitting here staring at this screen mm -hmm. so much that I'm starting to like, I'm going crazy, but I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised at like how well the classes are going online when yeah. all the students are online. I don't know if you've had this experience where you're hybrid. So if you're hybrid and some students are in the building and some are online, it really sucks for the ones that are on a computer. But my classes that I teach, four classes, all of mine are on the screen together and it feels like the classroom and they're bringing great work and, and we've learned some really great ways of collaborating and presenting work on screen. And I, I found it to be like actually pretty damn good. Um, good. And, to the, and the, the best part for me is as the program director, I'm actually got, I could pull in some of my really good friends and some really smart alumni that live in other cities to teach yeah. classes. And it, that's worked really well, really they can well. Jump in real quick. Like you give them an invite. And also, I mean, you're preparing these kids for not kids. These No, young no, no, no. You're, they're teaching whole classes. They're taking a whole class. Oh, good. Yeah, well, so I'm, I'm saying also, I think it's, it's really useful that you guys are figuring out online because that's how 
the workplace is. So Absolutely. it's not like it's very relevant and you have to learn. So that's a great way to do it, I think. And if you're able to be creative virtually, like in this setting, you'll be able to be creative tenfold when yeah. we get back in person. I have told them this. I've told them that this is actually the silver lining is that you're trained to do something that's more senior people are still trying to figure out. And um, mm -hmm. by learning your craft with these limitations, I think it actually gives you an extra weapon yeah. that you can work both ways. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Yeah. No, it's, it, it does seem like a great school. Um, I mean, it's an investment, right? And you're saying it, it'll pay off in the long term. Uh, like you to mentioned before, you said it, it, you keep your job in advertising, you not just oh, yeah. to break in. This helps you thrive in it for long term. Absolutely. I mean, I, you know, they're almost overqualified when they get into their first job and we have like a 96, 98% placement rate. So, I mean, good. like I said, I sleep at night because I think we're providing a really valuable training. It's a, it's a two year program, two year program. Yep. What's the, what's the first year? Like the, what's the second year? How do you break that down? So for, you know, for copywriters, art directors, it's a little bit, well, it's pretty much the same for art direction and copywriting It's the first year, generally speaking, I find is kind of unlearning what you've learned in college where there's oftentimes a right answer and you're supposed to learn the information, and spit it back out. Sure. And my challenge is trying to get students early on to like take risks, um, say things that are going to make them look like a fool or an idiot or, you know, kind of loosen up. And, mm -hmm. and the first year is a lot of sort of finding your feet, you're gaining confidence, finding your voice, finding your sensibility as an art director. Um, you're, you're plus learning sort of your capacity, how much can you take on at a time and, just kind of learning the ropes and there's a huge social component, especially when we're not virtual, but even virtually there's a huge social component because creatives still work in teams, art director, copywriter. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're thrown in a creative technologist, you're thrown in a photographer, graphic designer. And a lot of the first year is, is number one, kind of like unlearning the rote nature of education and taking risks and, be, and learning how to be more artistic. And number two, forming those relationships and gravitating towards the partnerships that you kind of think are going to work for you in the second year. And the second year is when you start, start sort of fleshing out parts for your portfolio. You start producing things, working much more on craft, working much more on um, copy craft. It's one thing to have an idea and say it. It's another to be able to say it really well. Um, it's it's one thing to be able to, to come up with a visual solution, but to craft that and get the photography just right, get the kerning and the lettering and the spacing and everything beautiful and perfect, that sort of start, starts happening the second year. And we have, um, we have student award shows every two quarters, and we have portfolio reviews after every 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 other grad, no, every graduation, everybody gets a portfolio review, national or regional portfolio review, and those are going online. Um, those have been really successful. And um we also work really hard on the big student competitions. The one show in New York has a student nice. competition and the British designers and art directors has a bunch of different briefs that they do. So, um, yeah. Yeah. That's huge for those creative students, those award shows. There's a lot of prep that goes into those. I'm sure that you guys help out with, cause that's, it's pretty crucial to the process. I would say. Yeah. I, I hate it actually. And I hate, mm. I hate, I hate if anybody in the one show is listening to me say, I hate the award shows, but I feel like doing ads to win awards is not really our, our purpose. Our purpose, and you can respect this if you're in, in account management, like, you know, advertising creative is a tool of commerce. You know, our job is to solve business problems. Mm -hmm. And our job is to like, is to say, okay, what's the, what's the real problem you have here and how can we solve that creatively? It's not necessarily to come up with something that's going to appeal to an advertising judge to win a medal in a contest against your peers. Yeah, yeah. Um, but those awards on on resumes mean a lot because that's on not, resumes. Yeah, it's external validation. It's like I want I want a pencil. That, and, yeah. What's your take on the uh, moldy whopper that Burger King did? Because that won a lot of awards, uh, a lot of can lines, and then the and then I think at the same time McDonald's are pretty uh, response or maybe not directly was the um, Travis Scott meal like the 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 deal they had the promotional endorsement with travis scott they i think mcdonald's sold you know millions of burgers and burger king might not have sold much as much on paper but they've won so many different uh creative awards like what's your view there those are kind of two different sides of the coin there it's great it's a great question and my my opinion on that's very subjective i think that the best awards to win are effies you know i, I really do think that's the awards for the for like the biggest change in sales after a campaign oh okay so, I didn't know that. And my wife, who's also a copywriter, creative director, she she's very proud of the fact that she has a campaign in her portfolio that won an Effie and a nice. One Show Award. And I think the creative creative awards to me, like, I'm just, 
I think there's a purpose for them. I also think that they're very self-serving. It's like nobody really cares. It's like you're giving yourself an award for something most people hate. <laughs> and <laughs> and like you're giving yourself an award for something that a lot of people hadn't seen. And hopefully it worked. I actually think that the Moldy Whopper is a really great idea because it, it really is a great demonstration. Um, so creatively, I think it's wonderful. If it doesn't move product though, I, I question it. And th that I might be an outlier in the creative field of saying that, no. but I think you could do both. I mean, I, the thing about my background is I was an account guy before I was a creative. So I kind of knew what the job was of advertising before I started writing ads. So for mm -hmm. me, everything I've ever done has been like friggin' on point strategically. It has to work first. Then you apply your craft to, to make that thing work in a way that no one would have thought of. Gotcha. And what's the FE again? What, what's the award for? It's my wife's award? Oh, no, no. Just the FE is... F it's for effectiveness. That's what it stands for. So it's FEs are given for like for advertising effectiveness. I heard of it. I just didn't... I never clicked that together. Yeah. <laughs> I've never won one. No, I haven't won one either. Actually, I might have. I don't know. What agencies did you work for back in the day? So I started off in New York at Ogilvy. Um, it was called That's Ogilvy and Mather in the day. Um, I was there yeah. for three and a half years. And then I worked at a business-to-business -business agency... That was like advertising nirvana. It was a, this is a, actually a really important lesson, I think, for, for young people getting in the business. Like, don't, you don't necessarily need to go to the place that's the famous place to do great work and build your portfolio or have a really great experience. And it was an agency that everything we did, the clients loved. Most of the stuff we did there won awards because they were lesser known categories where the work wasn't really in those categories. The bar was pretty low. So, we had all come from great agencies and we just presented great work and the clients bought it. And it was advertising. It was really was like advertising Nirvana. It's, what called, was that? Called, it's called Anderson and Lemke. Then I worked for a, a guy named Tony Angotti, who was an old school guy from like New York advertising from the sixties and seventies. He wrote like friends don't let friends drive drunk and BMW, the ultimate driving machine. He did all the fosters oh, Australian for beer. Um, I worked with him. He was actually my partner until he, he retired. And then I worked at publicist for the last, um, year or two that I was in New York and I worked exclusively on Fujifilm. I did all the ads for every Fujifilm product, professional oh, film, nice. consumer film, digital cameras, consumer cameras. Um, and when I moved to Atlanta, I continued doing freelance for Fuji directly from the client for a couple of years, which is nice. pretty cool. Cool brand, Fuji. Yeah, really cool. Fuji. Really interesting story too, because they, uh, they were superior to Kodak, but couldn't break into the U.S. market when they came right after World War II. So they had to sell at a discount, and they kind of got labeled. They could never escape wow. that sec that second place um, position. What um is some of your what are some of your highlight reel um pieces that you can recall now? Shout out that you you're proud of. You know, no one's ever asked me that question, but I'll tell you what my favorite piece in my portfolio was. I'll tell you why. It was a piece that that didn't run through the machine. Um, it was an emergency ad that we got assigned on like a Thursday morning that had to be completed by end of day Friday to get to stations. And it was like a, oh. a Father's Day commercial. And, um, and it was basically, this was back in the day where like... <laughs> If you lose your landline to call long distance, they made money on it. So they wanted to do, it was called caller stimulation was the thing. They wanted you to call your dad on Father's Day. And we wrote this script, my partner and I wrote the script in like an hour. And we we had a couple of them, but one that was that ended up getting sold. And we went to the studio and recorded it and found found footage. And it was like a really sweet commercial that like didn't have the time to get like second guessed. And it, it sometimes deadlines are like a, an incredible gift for creators because you, you know you you don't have time to kind of overthink it yeah a little bit of parameters i, I i've talked to some creatives where they kind of like that like a little bit of a box around them yeah hmm. where okay. was that uh, where was that at where were you working then where where was that was at ogilvy um that was for 9x that ended up becoming verizon um and uh it was just a sweet commercial and i did a lot of really what i thought was some pretty cool print at a and l but I just like to write. I found that what kind of what excites me is solving complex problems, making complex problems sound simple. Hmm. Um, it's sort of a thing that I enjoyed as a writer, and you, you know, you just kind of keep an eye out for the kind of things that 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 you maybe do better than other people, or that you are comfortable doing that other people aren't. Yeah. What was your favorite uh, Super Bowl ad? Um, you know, <laughs> the one that I thought that stood out to me as as sort of felt honest to me and and was sweet was the Budweiser brands spot because it was one that acknowledged the pandemic in a real way. 
the one about let me buy you a beer. I was uh, thinking that. I knew you were going to say that. And I, I just thought that it was like the vignettes, those little moments. Yeah. Um, it just it just felt honest to me. I just thought it was really cool. And I like I like what Reddit did. Um, yeah, the five second. Yeah, I thought those were both really cool. What about you? I read your mind. I, I read your mind. I knew you were going to say the Budweiser one. How'd you no, I like the uh, yeah, I like that one too. The the let's have it, let's grab a beer. What that's what it was. Let me buy you a beer, to, maybe. Let's have buy a beer. A beer. Awesome. Yeah, I got the ad age. I wonder. I think they gave that one four or five stars. You know what? Um, okay. What are the other options? Okay, I want to go back to portfolio school real quick. What mm-hmm. are the other options? So I'm a creative in this uh magical world we're living we'll make up for now i'm a creative what are my other options if i don't want to go to portfolio school can i go pick up like a small agency job like what's stopping me from working at a local uh small startup and getting experience there what why can't i do those types of smaller gigs and then work well, my way up well if someone's willing to take a risk on you that's cool i i, I just think that um <clears throat> it's a really good question and i think it depends on the person i think if you're resourceful And you can, you still are going to somehow have to prove to the place you want to work that you have what it takes. So you can either pay to go to a school where you're given the parameters of assignments and partners and and instructors to kind of mentor you, or you just take a risk and create stuff on your own that you can show, like you give yourself assignments, you give yourself projects. You're still going to have to, at some point, prove that you can do the job and prove the way you think creatively. Um, I think that when I say there's other ways in, I'd say, you know, internships that could turn into jobs. I'd say, you know, if you have a, like I said, a YouTube channel that, you know, you just create stuff that's cool. That has a bunch of, yeah. I mean, that's a tough task for sure. I'm not sure I'd have it in me, Um, but there are agencies like Widen and Kennedy um, in Portland that they, they take people who are influencers that have no training in advertising and they, then they pair them with someone from an ad school mm-hmm. or a traditional background. That's part of their model is to bring unconventional, untraditional thinking into the building. Problem is a lot of agencies just need stuff made. I mean, they just need banner ads, written radio commercials and print ads and commercials done. So they, they don't have the energy to train someone or take a risk on them. Um, working for free, you know, I have a, I have an alumnus who called me over the weekend who's at a job that he's not happy and he says, you know, can I just ask an agency for a brief to work on? So oh. no, they're not going to give you a brief to work on. Oh. There's like all sorts of legal issues with that. And I said, because, and I said, but the Sounds reason like a good idea, it seems like a good idea. I said, but you got to get in their system somehow. Like yeah. they're going to have to somehow have you in their system either to pay you or not pay you. But, you know, say you'll be an intern for free if you can work nights or whatever, you know, can I be an intern? You don't have to pay me. Somehow make it, you know, create a place for yourself to to sh- yeah. to show how you how you think. So it's not out of the question. Hmm. And that when you said that, I was like, "That's genius." Ask for a brief, but yeah, I guess that probably some legal issues there. I think there's problems with that. Like I worked for a TV show when I got out of college, and they won't even open if they get scripts sent to them. They have to throw them directly in the garbage and return them unopened. They, that's what they do. They have to hmm. return them unopened. Uh, because if they ever come up with an idea that's similar, they have to prove that they didn't see that person's idea. And then and they're not in the business of like reading spec scripts. It just doesn't work that way. What about um, what agencies do you kind of respect right now? I know it's like uh, agencies are always changing. They're based off clients and, you know, in the pandemic. But what have who have you seen in the past couple of months that you were like, really? Wow, I would love for some of my uh, students to land at these agencies. You know, it's it's it, I'm going to go ahead and and reframe the question in my mind because yeah, go ahead. I don't do a really good job of following what agencies are doing, but I know where some of my favorite people work. <laughs> yeah. 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 Where do you, and, where do your favorite people work? And like a couple of the smartest writers that I've ever known are at arts and letters in, in Richmond. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I heard about them. There's a guy named Greg Hahn who used to run BBDO New York and now has a small place called mischief and they do cause stuff, but they also just do yeah. really 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 friggin smart stuff and where's that at you know i think it's virtual i think it's mm-hmm. kind of like um they don't i don't know, even sure they have a, a place but if they do i think he's in new york but um it's yeah, uh but they they did a really cool thing for uh vaccination just a simple little campaign for encouraging people to get vaccinated um 
you know, I, I, I really, it all comes down to the people. I mean, all yeah. an advertising agency is, is the people that are there. Uh, and any place that's, that's, that's great uh, is great because the people that are already there. And I, what I often will tell students when they graduate is the number one criterion for a job is opportunity. Where can you go get stuff made? Where can you go matter? Where can you go be important? Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't have anything to do with, with the name on the door um, at the first job. I think that's a huge thing for me still today is is the name and because I'm just getting out of college. That's all I've wanted was a big name on my resume. Mm -hmm. I feel like I, I if I don't have a big name on my resume, then I'll never be able to go adventure out. I need to have that first checklist item. But you're saying maybe not worry about that so much. Go find where you're needed, where, where great people are. But it's hard to say that to somebody just breaking in because they'll take any job right now. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with going to a name. I mean, when I said Ogilvy, you've heard of it, which is kind of cool. So, um, you know, I had a classmate that I hadn't seen in years, and I saw his career career trajectory. I saw his name because he had just won a lion at Cannes, mm -hmm. like a uh, at Wyden and Kennedy in Amsterdam for Honda. And I was like, where? How did he end up there? And he had worked at like no name places and just kind of had this kind of slow build to, to a career that was amazing. Yeah. So there's just a lot of different. There's a lot of different ways to get there. Yeah. But that's just, I'm telling you, that's a lot. Well, that's how us students and recent grads think. They, if you, for the most part, if we don't have that big name on our resume, we feel like we, there's a, a gap, there's a hole. Well, you know what, you know what else though, Gino, that I think is important is that when you're graduating from college or even when you're graduating from a portfolio school, your whole life has been these little spurts. You got nine months of school and then summer, nine months of school mm -hmm. and then summer. Everything's measured in these little, increments, even high school, four years, college, four years. You don't realize when you get out of college that like your career is not measured in years, it's measured in decades, multiple decades. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, a, it's a marathon pace, not a sprint pace. Now I'm not saying you shouldn't work and we shouldn't sp sprint or work hard, but like that first, you can make a terrible mistake early on in your career, your first job, and it won't cost you anything. Like yeah. you have plenty of time to, you're going to probably redefine. I'd redefine my career halfway through it and became like full-time teacher and educator. So, you know, you just don't have a sense of how expansive a career is when you're first leaving. You feel this desperate stress to get a great job. Yeah. Get a, get a job. Yep. Then it'll work out. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And I, it, it, yes, I understand that, but it's just nice to hear that again, you know, from, uh, from you. So I appreciate that. Um, but like um, any other, I, I want to wrap it up here now with just some, standard tips that you have for people yeah. networking in the COVID world. Uh, yeah. you, you, you've figured it out teaching wise. <laughs> you, you, you kind of got a good grip on it for students. All that. What do you tell your students when it comes to networking, helping them out? Um, I don't know at what process or point that's at, but what advice do you have? Now um, all right. World? So I guess this is kind of, all right. So I have five pieces of advice okay. and I think networking is baked into a couple of them. Um, this is advice I think that works for pros as well as people who are breaking and entering uh, the business, right? So sure. number one, this is a lesson that I wish someone had told me, be patient with everybody, with others. Like people are doing their best, whether you think they are or not. Um, don't be impatient with people who, that you think are incompetent or sabotaging you. Be very patient with people. Um, everybody's doing their best, all right, number one. Um, number two, and this, is, this, is, this has to do, I think, with also with, with networking. Listen, right? Listen to clients. Listen to your partners of all kinds. So that's professional partners and also your life partners. Actually sure. listen to them. Um, yeah. ask, ask questions. This is all part of number two. And make time to meet with professors, creative directors, ACDs with real questions. Just say, I have a question. Get to know the people who are above you. That's how you build mentorship. That's how you build your network, by asking questions, reaching out to someone that you respect and say, look, I, I'm working on this thing. What do you think of this? Or... I have this this challenge. I just want to get your take on it, um, and and really listen. I think that's that's number two. Um, number three, I was going to say be on time, but that's lame. That's what your dad would say. So um, bring what you what you're asked to bring and more. Right? Nobody's ever going to assign you bring more. So you have yeah. to assign that to yourself. Do more than you're asked for. Do cover cover your bases, but also come in and say, you know, I was also thinking about this thing. And if one of those things kind of, if someone's willing to take a risk on an idea that they didn't think of even giving you to do, that can be a career maker. I like that. I got to start uh, doing that. Right? Uh, yeah, um, I just, 
I, I sometimes I get away. I just do the bare minimum because I'm doing a bun- bunch of different little things at once. But you know, sometimes if I, I my creativity has lacked uh, since I started, and I'm just trying to get the bare minimum done, trying to get everything out there. So now I'm going to bring it up. I'm going to bring it what I got. Right, and I say that because I've noticed this. It's going to make me sound old. I've I've taught through like the millennials and Gen Z, and I think that now in Gen Z, I think there's this this there's a unhealthy emphasis put on precision meaning that they want to be told, tell me what I'm supposed to do because I'm going to do it perfectly. Mm-hmm. And that's fine. But what really what your value is, especially in advertising, especially for creatives, is something that that the people above you wouldn't have even considered mm-hmm. doing. So do that. Um, point, oh, number yeah. four, point number four, um, and listeners, you have to know that I apologize if I'm stepping on Gino because like right after we started recording this, his pick, his video froze. So I can't read any of his body language. So I apologize if I'm like interrupting him. <laughs> Just it's all good. I can see my picture frozen too. I apologize about that. All right. All good. Number four, uh, you can c- cut all that out if you want to. Number four, um, this is, I'm going to talk to any creatives that are listening to this podcast. Uh, if you're going into a creative career, you've basically just signed a deal with the devil where you can no longer say that you should do anything. You have to make Everything you think of. If you have an idea for a, a, a blog, you have an idea for a commercial, a, a parody, a video, uh, whatever it is, as stupid as it might be, you have to make that thing because agencies want to see the things that you did that no one asked for. And because that one thing could be something like a podcast that is the thing that you end up being known for. So don't say should, make it. It can suck. Let it suck. Do nine sucky things. The 10th one will get you a job. Amazing. All right. Love and the, that. And the fifth one, which to me is so vital in the world that we know what happens now with echo chambers on social media and algorithms. If you've seen, you know, the social dilemma, it's very real that we're not stimulated outside of our interests. The most important piece of advice I can give anybody, especially young people, is do do something that does not interest you at all. If you hear about a cl- a cooking class coming to your neighborhood or there's something happening at your church or synagogue that just doesn't sound interesting to you. The place where you're not interested is the place you're going to most learn and grow as a professional person. Um, That's something I have to constantly tell myself. I don't want to do that thing, but I know that I'll end up being glad I did it. And it could be a life changer. Hmm. Any of those you've done recently? Um, You know, I'm doing a a seminar next week that I don't want to do. I'm so tired of sitting on the screen and yeah. I actually carved out time for myself next week to go hiking or play disc golf or do something late in the afternoon just to breathe. And I signed up for the seminar. Don't want to do it. And I can, I guarantee you, Gino in two weeks, I'll tell you, I, I'm so glad I did that. Um, hmm. so yeah. Um, I better be glad, better be glad yeah, I did it. Yeah. Seminar. <laughs> Sounds fun. <laughs> a webinar. It's a webinar. It's an advertising webinar. So, but nice. it's but it's coming at an angle that's different from what I do. So I'm mm-hmm. I'm hoping it's going to be. Um, it's not something that I would necessarily want to do. Awesome. Well, great advice. Great episode. And I appreciate you coming on. For the listeners out there, how can they reach out to you? Do you want them to reach out to you? Um, sure. What's What's uh, the best way to do so? Sure. Well, you can find the podcast if you just go anywhere and search Dan Balser podcast. Mm-hmm. It's on Spotify. It's in balserville.com is my um, podcast webpage with all pictures and stuff like that. You can email me if you want, dbalser, dbalser, yeah. D-B-A-L-S-E-R. Go listen to the podcast. Yeah, dbalser. Sure. At, at, yeah, thanks, man. Appreciate that. dbalser at me.com is my email. Just mention that, um, mention the Breaking and Entering podcast and send me a note and um, love to chat. Cool. And then I'll also collect uh, your recommended resources. So go to our Instagram listeners at entering ad on Instagram to see his recommended resources. But that is it for now. Dan, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Gina. I really appreciate it, man. Appreciate it so much. Thank you all for listening to this entire episode of the Breaking and Entering Advertising Podcast. I hope you enjoyed this week's guest. Make sure you go and connect with them on LinkedIn. Tell them that Breaking and Entering sent you. Now, thank you to Mikey Malarkey, our audio technician, and Buchan Zhang, our creative director, as well as the student team from the Midnight Oil Agency at the University of Illinois. Can't do it without you all. Thank you very much. We will see you all next week with another amazing guest.